Welcome to Good Follow presented by DraftKings. I'm Megan Reyes. Joining me are Logan Hackett and Katie Novotny. Well, it's another week, another milestone for Caitlin Clark. She's pretty much guaranteed Rookie of the Year with Angel Reese out for the rest of the season. And we'll have more on Angel later. But Caitlin's accomplishments are surpassing those not just of rookies. She's making her mark on WNBA history at this point. Let's take a look at the latest. Clark has brought enormous interest to the WNBA. The spotlight has extended to tons of other players. She's dominating offensively in a way that's changing the Encore product all as a rookie. So I have a question for the two of you that might sound a bit hyperbolic, but is Caitlin Clark's rookie year in the WNBA the most important single season in the history of modern sports? That's a crazy Not. question. What a swing! Hey, we're starting the show off uh, stirring lots of pots. I want to hear. I want to hear thoughts. I mean, we live in a world of ex- extremism, so let's talk about it. Um, I, I think, I think that's a that's a bold. Ah, it's bold. It's bold. There's so many. There's so many other years. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Well, who do you think has had more impactful single season in the history of sports, men's and women's? I I think everything as a whole, it's up there. Like when you take her play and everything off of the court and how much noise there is, like it's definitely up there. Mm -hmm. When it comes to like like in sports history, single season, (laughs) I don't think so. Like there's been so many other greats. Maybe when she retires, we'll look back and be like, wait, yeah, like she ate, like that's going to be up there. But I think because we've seen so many other athletes kind of go through their career. Now we look back at their rookie season. We're like, oh my gosh, that was crazy. Like what Serena did, like Mm -hmm. her whole come up was so insane. Now that she's as big as she is, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I don't think for now we can classify it as the biggest or most important sports history, but maybe in like 10 years. Yeah. I think if there was like a timeline, you know, like in a museum, it would definitely be a specific like dash. There would be a huge dash of like Caitlin Clark rookie season, but I don't, but I, there would be a bunch of other dashes next to it like before. And there's probably going to be some after. So I don't know. I don't, we need more data. We need more data points as my therapist would say, what are the (laughs) data points? Well, I think I agree that the question is hyperbolic. And I think it's really unfair to look at someone's rookie season and automatically classify it as one of the most important in modern sports history, because that's also, I feel, wildly unfair to her um, as a rookie. And yeah, you look at Serena and you look at even in men's sports, you look at LeBron James and Michael Jordan. And even again, as you all know, I have a history, a background with the Warriors, things that Steph Curry has done. And I think if you were to look at any of their single season as rookies, you would also kind of be like, well, let's take a step back before we start saying greatest of all time after a rookie year. Like, let's see how they shape out before we start jumping there. But um, while we're on this topic, the next question I want to ask is if Caitlin retired today, again, this might be hyperbolic. Would she be the most important WNBA player of all time? I also <laughs> think it's, I also think this is too soon to say. Mm-hmm. I, w- I was gonna, one other thought I had that might bridge the gap here a little bit. I do think that what we're seeing is historical in general. Like, I think there's a, there's a pop culture history to it. There's a women in coming into our own angle to it. So I do think it's very significant. And I almost feel like it's, uh, it's the Malcolm Gladwell tipping point there, regard, whatever, whatever you want to argue, it is a tipping point. It is showing us something. It is getting people excited. We are seeing record numbers. I think it's impossible to say it isn't historical in one way, shape or form. So I think we're, I think we have a baseline, you know, Mm -hmm. but I just don't know Again, I don't think we, I think it's too soon to say for either on either side of this, on either side of these questions. So Logan, give us a quick history lesson. In your opinion, who are the players and the either current or former WNBA players that you think should be considered the most important of all time? The first one that comes to mind immediately is Maya Moore. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, what a legend. That's like one of the biggest what ifs I have. I still think to that to this day, like what if she stayed in the league, but everything that she's doing, like, 
outside after she retired was so amazing. And then winning the chip, like multiple times carrying that whole team. I think she stands out as the most important, but then you also have like Sue Bird. To me, she was kind of, I'm trying to find a comparison in soccer, maybe like the Alex Morgan-esque, like getting people into it and kind of being that big name. All these people, or I guess with all that being said, all these people pave the way for the league and situation that Caitlin is in right now. I was gonna say, we're forgetting about our founding mothers, you know, like the founding (laughs) mothers need to be a part of this conversation because we wouldn't be here without them. I think that's the most important thing to remember when anyone is really discussing what Caitlin Clark is doing for the growth of the W is what she is doing is absolutely important in this day and age in this current time. And it's also completely unfair to overlook everything that the people before her has done, have done, as you have all said, to set herself and all the other current players up for success. I think that's really like the two things being true here that sometimes are getting missed in these conversations. Yeah, I still think about the Rebecca Lobo, Lisa Leslie, and Cheryl Swoops cards I had as like an eight-year-old when all the boys were getting their Pokemon cards. And I was like, can I get these? (laughs) And everyone was like, who are you talking about? You know, like they, they just did so much and it was such a, we need to, we need to keep that in mind. Well, let's talk about Angel Reese. As we mentioned earlier, Angel announced on social media that she has suffered a season ending injury. But what stuck out to me is when she said this. Through it all, I have showed that I belong in this league, even when no one else believed. All I have ever wanted was to come into the W and make an impact. I can confidently say I have done that and will strive to keep doing so. So WNBA Commissioner Kathy Engelbert compared Reese and um, Angel and Caitlin Clark's rivalry to <laughs> Bird and Magic this week. So should we remember Angel Reese's rookie year mostly in terms of her individual accomplishments and the things that she's done on and off the court or her rivalry with Caitlin Clark? Individual accomplishments by far. We're going to look back at it and be like, oh, this rivalry was so sick. Like, remember when Caitlin and Angel were beefing? Honestly, or not even beefing, but having that rivalry, they could end up on the same team in the near future, like if they stay in the league for long enough. But I think definitely her accomplishments and like how it carried over from her college success and kind of like the legacy she left there at LSU, Mm -hmm. um, the rivalry is just always going to be up in the clouds and like there and present. I almost think you can't have one without the other because I think people love a storyline and I think people love rivalry. It's part of sports, right? It's part of why we love competition and why we love cheering for one team and not cheering for another. And I think they both brought like passion, the passionate fans to the forefront. And I'm just, I would be curious in an alternative world, what, the conversation would be had they entered the W in two different years. Like what, what would that sound like? What would that look like? Would we care as much? Like, I think the the power of both of them and their athleticism created something very special. And I think it's really cool. And like, I don't know. I, I also remember back in, like back in the day when I was a big Bulls fan in the nineties. And it was like, it was like the Utah jazz and the Chicago Mm -hmm. Bulls. And it was like, who's going to be. And it was like a whole thing. And it was so fun. And it was so special to be a part of. So I like, I love seeing it as a whole picture and not to discount her individual accomplishments, which are a plenty, but I think the combination of them has really made this a very cool season to watch. I, and I'll just to wrap this conversation, I'll keep my thoughts short, but as you've heard me say today and multiple times in the past, I'm such a believer in multiple things being true. Like I'm not a very black and white person. There's a lot of gray in this world. And I agree that their storyline and their rivalry is what is helping make the W so exciting. One of the many storylines that's helping make the W so exciting. And at the same time, I think it's, again, unfair to look at Angel's rookie season and have to qualify it with because of Caitlin Clark. I think we need to be able to separate the two and say their storyline is very exciting and has helped bring a lot of attention to the W and on her own. Angel has done really incredible things on and off the court um, with or without Caitlin. So (laughs) those are my thoughts on it. I feel like a lot of times Caitlin gets added into a conversation to help qualify maybe why this person or this moment is happening and is doing it at such an exciting growth, but 
that's neither here nor there. And we'll talk about that more at a different time. But moving on, as we're still talking about the W after recent losses, the LA Sparks have locked up the best odds to win the number one pick in the 2025 draft, which could send our girl and social media's favorite Paige Beckers to LA. Could you all imagine a team with Cameron Brink once she's back, Rakea Jackson and Paige Beckers all on the same court? The internet would absolutely lose their mind. They need like their own TikTok channel, like Paige Camilla or something. <laughs> that would, oh my God, the numbers would be so good with that. But also it translates to on the court, like that's a both off the court and on the court thing. And then with everybody that they have around, like they could make a run. It would, it would be very likely. Well, the NBA is often accused of rigging the draft lottery, and the WNBA hasn't faced those allegations yet. And after all, if you look at this year, Caitlin Clark is playing in Indiana. But if the W were to rig the lottery, where would you like to see Paige go? I'll start with you, uh, Katie. Where should Paige end up if the W could rig the lottery? I know it's a long shot, but with uh, the recent string of L's uh, and my hometown, I'm gonna I'm gonna double down on Sky, and I just think again, I'm going back to all my other super bad Chicago teams. We do so bad, and then we get someone good, and then there's excitement, and then there's possibility, and I just would love to see that happen. The other probably maybe more likely like I think Dallas is also Mm. maybe in there. I don't know, but like, I just, I was looking at their, the 13 and 22 record and just like, you know, just like shedding a single tear down my cheek and she has so much buzz and she's such a cool fun personality she might fit in really like i feel like the chicago ones would really love her logan what do you think do you think Paige could go home i was thinking that that was one of the first things that came to mind but take it to the other side of the states and put her in las vegas I would oh, love to see okay, that. So her personality. Vegas isn't home. <laughs> no, Vegas isn't home. Like New York or Connecticut is like home. Connecticut, New York. She could go between those two. I think she would really make an impact on both the teams. And they're like doing really well. But based on her personality and like just player vibes, I want to see her in Vegas. <laughs> I think staying in Connecticut would be cool if that could work out. Um going back to Minnesota, where she's from and playing for the Lynx could also be cool. Awesome. And then There's also, and she a while ago put something on social media about it. I would love to see her at Golden State. And she did, I think it was either a tweet. She put something on social media saying that purple is one of her favorite colors. So I think (laughs) being Paige at a brand new expansion team could also be pretty exciting having her in San Francisco. I completely forgot Paige was from Minnesota. I don't know why. Me too. Connecticut, obviously. And I was watching a video this morning with her in her high school uniform talking about leaving her brother, um, like right before her freshman year and how sad it was making her and she didn't want to think about it. I don't know why I just completely placed that in Connecticut and not Minnesota, but Minnesota, yes, especially with like the year and elevation that they're having. And I think her and Alyssa Peely would go really well together. Now that I'm, you're saying that, I'm like, okay, she's done the Midwest. She's done the East Coast. We need to get her on this side of the country. So I'm, I'm just changing, I'm changing my, my, my answer based on me wanting her more experiences in the United States in general. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see what happens next year uh, when Paige enters the draft. But coming up, Logan and I sit down with analyst and former NWSL forward Darian Jenkins to discuss the NWSL and Alex Morgan's retirement. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Good Follow. Joining us today is analyst and former NWSL forward Darian Jenkins. Darian, we are so excited to have you on. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let's do this. I'm looking forward to it. Well, let's start with the biggest news out of the NWSL, something I know you've talked a lot about, Alex Morgan's retirement. On the field, we know how much she's done and what's it like to see a player of her caliber say goodbye. It's 
surreal because she almost seems like one of those iconic players. You know how you have the the Mia Hams, the Abby Wombachs, the Martas, where you can't really imagine the game without that type of player, without their name floating around in a lineup or in contention for a spot at the Olympics, the World Cup. It doesn't seem real that we're not going to be talking about her on the pitch anymore. Um, mm-hmm. It's very bittersweet, but I think it's a really beautiful thing for players. This is coming from someone that had to medically retire just because of a prior injury that a player gets to step away at their own choice. It's at their own discretion and their body's not forcing them out. The game's not forcing them out. And a player of her caliber Yes, we would have loved to see sort of a victory tour of Alex Morgan as they've done with former national team players. But I think it's a very beautiful way where she gets to retire at home in front of her family with her daughter walking her out onto the pitch. And it's for a reason where she's growing her own family. So I think it's a really it's a really beautiful way to step away from the game. And having such an amazing career, like literally start to finish, what kind of legacy do you think she leaves behind for the young girls and the future of the sport? I mean, the impact of the pink pre-wrap is (laughs) insane. I I don't think the game, we're always going to think of AM13 when we think of the the pink pre-wrap, but her legacy goes so beyond that. I mean, looking at her, even her retirement match and all of the little girls and even the little boys and the adults crying because of the impact that she's left on them and her talking about Uh, with Charlie and her retirement video that she's created and been such a pivotal human in the pathway of young kids seeing themselves as professional soccer players. So she's created this lane, this avenue, this visibility because of how marketable she's made herself in these positive ways that are growing the game. Uh, But for the generation of players that are coming up that are just at the cusp of maybe playing pro or wanting to go pro, She has made, and for me personally, it's such a safe space to want to go pro. There's this really harsh reality that when I left UCLA and got drafted to go pro, I was like, oh my God, I miss college. What the hell is this? I thought professional was going to be everything's together. It's going to be even better than college. There's going to be 20 trainers. Everybody has their own (laughs) blah, blah, blah. Nothing like that from when I started in 2017. Now it's night and day from those moments, but she has been pivotal in it becoming so much more professionalized and it actually being desirable and celebrated to be a professional women's soccer player. Also agree with you wholeheartedly on the playful front about the pink pre-wrap because (laughs) I mean, even the game last week when all her teammates were the pink pre-wrap and then they had that goal early on. And when they huddled, I was like, wait, which one is she? Because now (laughs) they all have pink pre-wrap on. I can't spot her out. (laughs) Um, But your time with Alex overlapped for a few years while you were in the league. Do you have a favorite moment with her of her on or off the pitch? Uh, I would say I'm pretty sure she scored a goal against me when I was playing with Seattle. It's not a favorite moment, but I was like, damn, yeah, she's that that she's her she's really really freaking good um but for me it's how she looked out for players that weren't uh on the national team um i've talked kind of at length about this but everything she did with the cba with monashim with tweeting and calling the nwsl out for not even having an hr department Mm -hmm. um using her name her platform her visibility, um, her following to bring attention to what players like me who weren't on the national team but had a good career were calling out for change in the NWSL. And that really made my career that much better the last few years I had um, because people were finally looking out, taking things seriously, that players wanted better, whether it's standards, facilities, safety, better coaches hired, more qualified people working in the front office or in the medical space for these teams. And she was pivotal in that. So for me, that's that's my Alex Morgan favorite moment. Okay, let's talk about this NWSL season. This weekend, we have such an exciting matchup with number one Orlando against number three Casey Curran, which also happened to be two of your former teams. What yeah. can we expect from this matchup? Oh, well, I expect I'll start with Orlando with my pride girlies, um, since that's my most recent team. And we interviewed Seb on Attacking Third a couple weeks ago. And He was just very adamant that we're going to stick to our game plan. We're going to come out. It was also the first time they played each other a couple weeks ago. And he said, we're just going to test the waters and see 
how we each handle each other. There's no set game plan. We both have very distinct styles. Um, and then Vladko, on the other hand, also said similar. We're going to come out and test each other's styles. We don't know. Clearly, Orlando had the upper hand in that match. Um, I think Chawinga is an absolute cheat code, but Orlando as a team had a far better game. And I think in this one, we'll see Vladko change up defensively quite a bit because Orlando has so many yacked players. I mean, Marta, Adriana, Summer Yates, um, Barbara Banda, like there's there's so many players that you have to look out for. And I think Kansas City defensively is gonna have to ship but shift. But I think it's gonna be a bit of a little bit more of an open sort of slug match because the one and number three is gonna be is gonna be really fun to watch with these two attacking sides. I've also noticed that in the past five games, Tema Wenga has been the only goal scorer, which yep. like they were just setting a record with like 17 goal scorers. So it went from that to just solo. What do you think they need to improve on on their offense to have other people score? Because Tema can't be doing it all. Well, teams have figured them out a little bit. Um, they play in a three back and you send a lot of numbers forward and they're very transitional. Teams now have scouted that and said, well, we'll just send balls behind your back line where you're going to be turned around. You're going to have to be defending. I mean, even the incredible goal that uh, Chewinga scored last week where Labonta's dribbling and just sends mm-hmm. this beautiful textured pass forward. Chewinga's behind like three defenders and still catches up to the ball. She's literally a cheat code. But if they didn't have that, there's not going to be much more in their attack. Um, so yet they need to get, I've said all season and, Vladko gives me a hard time about this, but I said all year that defensively, they just it look very out of sorts. I think something needs to shift there because everyone else, every team is now figured out how to turn them around so that they're not just sending balls forward into the attack. Um, but I think with Bia being back, Sashi got some minutes last game is going to be huge for them because she's she's insanely good. And her and Chewing, I think, complement each other really, really well. Well, so looking at Orlando, as we know, they're having an incredible record-breaking season. And you mentioned the talent that they have. But aside from the talent, like, what is their game plan? What's working so well for them? I think it's that they share the wealth. There's, yes, you have a Barbara Banda on the team who's scoring an insane amount of goals. But she hasn't been scoring lately, yet they're still winning. Other players are taking the reins and putting goals in the back of the net. Um, and so I think what their secret is, is everybody's bought into the game plan. Even when there's, you watch Marta play, she goes rogue. She's not at the 10. She's like up at the upper right top of the box or something. Um, they all know how to fill in for each other. They all know the roles that they're playing. They all know how to execute the principles that Seb Hines has coached them on. And that's why there's never really fluster or a change of their tempo and how they're playing. Whereas I think you see other teams have a panic moment where they're switching tactically. They're suddenly playing a completely different ball game where they're sending balls forward or they've lost the, you know, the sort of whatever makes their team special. I don't think we've seen Orlando falter in their game plan at all. So I think that's why they've been so solid this year. And I'm actually curious, do you think Orlando will stay undefeated like for the rest of the season and just win it all without having a loss? They gave me a lot of shit because I said they may get one loss before going to the championship. I I don't know if it'll happen anymore. You know the team Leverkusen um, in Germany, how they had an mm-hmm. um, they didn't lose a game. I think Orlando kind of has has that same dog in them this year. As a player, do having these long win streaks and just like undefeated streaks add a different level of pressure, or is it just like all right, we're just taking every game in the moment, see what happens. When I played with Orlando, we had, or excuse me, on Orlando with North Carolina, I think we had a streak where we only lost one match in the entire year. Actually, when I was at UCLA too. And for when you're at that level, it just adds, I think, a little bit more spiciness to your game because you know that everybody wants to beat you. You have this massive target on your back. But because things are going so well, you haven't lost, you're having so much fun playing, it's going to take so much to bring you down. And what we've seen with Orlando, which is really why I believe they're not going to lose anymore, is that even when things do go wrong, they don't panic. You see nothing change in their game plan. They're still together. They still come out playing the same way. And to me, that's the identity of a really, or the mark of an identity of a really, really solid team that I don't think is going to be unbeatable or cannot be beaten. 
So one last question on this. We were talking about this before uh, you joined us is like, would you as a player, would you rather go completely undefeated and have your first loss come sometime in the playoffs? Or would you rather get that loss out of the way in the regular season and learn from it? Maybe give up the undefeated season, but have a strong playoff push. Oh, get the loss early in the year. Right. There's so many. And it is so chaotic too. Like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Well, I'll take the L against like Houston or something and let's let's win a championship. Like, we'll recover. But speaking of championships, I want to talk about Gotham. They're another top team. They're currently sitting fourth on the table right behind Washington and KC. Do you think Gotham has what it takes to go back to back? I don't. I don't know. I don't think they can beat okay. Orlando. And it was proven last week. Uh, yes, I think they're a solid team. I think they're also one of those teams that never change the way that they play. And they're bringing on, I mean, the highest of caliber players. But they're still not in Orlando. They still don't have the same fight. And I think array of goal scorers that we see Orlando have um, t game after game after game. I mean, Gotham's tied how many times? Um, only won a 1-0 game. Uh, and I think Orlando just shows that they have a little bit more depth to their attack, which is, I mean, crazy because Lynn Williams, Esther, Yasmin Wright. I mean, Gotham has a stacked attack, but I think in the way that they play, it suits Orlando really well. And they just have, I think they have a leg up this year. It's fair. And also, I mean, okay, I'm going to put this on the spot. Like, would it be different for Gotham this year if Midge was healthy? Yeah. I think they're missing that 1v1 artist on the wing. I mean, Midge is great on the ball. She loves to challenge players. And I think that brought a different dynamic, a different sort of personnel where, yeah, the players that are on Gotham right now that are on the roster can do that. I mean, Jess Silva is a great addition, um, but I know she's going to be out for a little bit. But I think Midge just was, it's such a shame that she had that injury because I feel like she just hit this consistent groove of where she was racking up assists. She was looking dangerous. And to me, she's the player that had that X factor where like, I'll compare her to a Barbara Banda where she's going to attract two, three defenders. That's going to leave open so many different people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Gotham really misses her this year. Lynn Williams has also been out for a bunch of games this season. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if Gotham has the same, the same bite without Midge. Before we go, Darian, I'm going to put you on the spot for a minute because the foundation of this show is that communities get built one good follow at a time. And every week we do a good follow. Each one of us shares our good follow of the week. And it can be a person, page, a brand that um, are doing really impactful things in women's sports. So who would you like to shout out as your good follow? I am going to shout out my friend's company, Jasmine Spencer, she's Angel City FC. I mean, she plays all over the pitch. She's a forward, she's a defender, former teammate of mine in Seattle. Um, but she has a sustainable clothing line called Jazz It Up. Um, and it's sportswear and it gives back to the community around LA or whatever market she's in. Um, and it's all sustainable, all recyclable. And it's really dope. So you should check it out. Give it a follow. Well, thank you for sharing your good follows with us. And thank you so much for joining us on the show. It was amazing to have you. Thank you for having me. Well, up next, Katie Logan and I pay tribute to legendary retired soccer stars with a game of Guess It. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Good Follow. Recently, U.S. soccer fans have said farewell to some of the game's most legendary players. In the past year alone, we've seen Ali Krieger, Julie Ertz, Megan Rapino, Sam Uis, Kelly O'Hara, who's retiring at the end of this season, and now Alex Morgan say their goodbyes. So to honor these retirees, we're playing a game of Guess Who?, and so here's how it's going to work. I'll read a quote from one of the recently retired players and Logan, Katie, and myself will try to guess who said it. Are you all ready? Mm -hmm. Let's okay. do this. <laughs> here's the first, I already can't, I'm already laughing. Here's the first one. Here's a quote. I'm really worried that after my retirement, my butt is going to get saggy. Do we think this is Sam Uis, Ali Krieger, or Megan Rapino? We all have this. to agree. I said that that's me. The answer is me. <laughs> I'm talking. I don't know. I that's a funny one. Logan, what do you think? Me is in Megan Rapino. 
So you kind of got that one, but I think it's Megan Rapino. You think it's Megan Rapino? Uh, yeah. I actually don't know who said this one, but I'm going to agree with you. So yeah. if we all agree on Megan Rapino, let's take a look and see if we got it right. It was like, you guys, I'm oh. just really nervous after our Wait, time. Wait, why? It's going to be saggy. That's I hilarious. Def definitely had Meg saying that. Like, it's, I felt like it was just something that she'd in, say. In her personality. In yeah. Her mm -hmm. Oh, I underestimated Allie. Okay, so we got that one wrong. Here's the next one. Quote, I feel like I can step away and it's not because mama can't play. She can play. Do we think this is Alex Morgan, Julie Ertz, or Allie Krieger? I actually know this one, but. Is it Alex Morgan? I feel like I. I feel, I feel like, like it's in that video. I feel like that's the obvious answer. So I feel like it's got to be a trick. It's Wait. Like a, it's like a misleading option. The other two. They're all moms. Yeah, they are. But I feel like Charlie is earlier. I feel like Charlie. Yeah. Wait, I feel like it's Alex Morgan. <laughs> Sorry, like, that was just a little. Or are we underestimating Allie again? That's what not, she's, it's kind of in the same vein. She has it a boy. A, that's it. That's what I'm just trying to think. I think Julie and Allie, they have boys and then Sloan is a girl, but then she'd be like, so my kids could play in that sense. I'm 98% positive. I know who this is. And my answer is Julie Ertz. Oh, I'm going to look dumb. <laughs> but I'm going to look dumb because I said, oh, I know who this is. And I'm no, I think by process of elimination, I think we already had an Alex Morgan answer. I th and or no, it's just top of mind. It's the easiest. It's the easiest answer. We just had Allie Krieger. So I'm going I'm critical thinking. I'm going Julie. I'm going to back yours, Megan. OK, <laughs> we could go Julie. <laughs> OK, our financial is Julie yours. Let's see if I was right. Like I could step away and be like, it's not a good one. <laughs> Mama can't play. I, rem I can vaguely play. remember this press conference. Yes. Okay. Julie Ertz. Mama can still play. We know that. So we did get that one right. And let's go to the next one. Quote, I swear to God, mom, I'll come home like twice a year now. Do we think this is Megan Rapino, Kelly O'Hara, or Sam Lewis? Who has the worst relationship with their mom? <laughs> that would be my answer. <laughs> I mean, I feel like this is something Sam Mewis would say. She's super funny. But then I could also mm. see, like, Megan Rapinoe is a very busy person. Yes. When is she going to Reading, California? Not that often. <laughs> I want to go with Sam. That was my initial thought, too. It just sounds like something Sam would say. But I'm torn. I don't know. So I'm going to let you two decide on the final answer. Okay. So you have... I'm going to... I'll. You have... You Our two top two is... It's definitely, you think it not Kelly. Definitely not Kelly. So it's either Sam or Meg. You guys I think, think it's Megan Rapino. Logan thinks it's something. I also think it's Logan, something Sam could say. So what's your gut? It was Sam initially, but now that I'm hearing it, I could, I definitely see Meg Rapino being like, I swear to God, mom, I'll come home twice a year now. Like just in the cadence that she speaks in. Oh, okay. Let's go let's with Megan. Go with, let's, oh, yeah. I was gonna say let's go with the gut. Let's go with the first <laughs> the first thought. Shoot. Okay. Let's see. I'll be around a lot more. I oh, I knew it. I'm in the background like somewhere here. Now. Look, I you're right there. I remember seeing you on this broadcast. Yeah. Okay. So welcome to Good Follow, where we're chronic overthinkers. If you haven't yeah. realized this, so <laughs> a simple game is actually not that simple. But let's go on to our next quote. Uh, we used to stay up late eating goldfish at camp, and it's over now. It's kind of oh, sad. Oh my um, God. Q vitamin C. Sam Mewis, Ali Krieger, or Kelly O'Hara? This one I want to go Sam Mewis because she's a snacker. <laughs> Clearly, snacks. <laughs> That's, I love that. I'm down. I'm down okay. to go with that one. <laughs> We're going to go with Sam Lewis. Are we right or wrong? I always say this is so stupid, but like yeah. me and Rose oh, used to like stay up late eating goldfish. I love fish Sam camp. and Christy. And the like, Newest sisters are just legendary. I, I just feel like that's something As that's like a friendship. It's a, on, a stupid thing that I share. I mean, the fact that she's sad about the goldfish. Yeah, it really brand. hits. I'm going to cry. <laughs> okay, we're not doing too bad at this. Let's do a couple more. I think I know this one, but it is, I don't think coaching <laughs> is in my future. So our options are Alex Morgan, Julie Ertz, or Kelly O'Hara. Didn't Alex Morgan just say that? I think she did. Yeah. yeah. I, I was like, am I being 
I couldn't tell what my brain was doing. I was like, am I? Doing <laughs> okay, let's go with Alex. Right or wrong? <laughs> I don't think coaching yeah, is in this my happened future. All of, uh, I, ha- I think that five days ago. Moments ago. Found my yeah. calling in um, just We're not too bad at this game. In women's sports. Let's go to the next one. The quote is I got to play a sport for my job. Like, what? So is this Julie, Allie, or Kelly? That's a tough one. For some reason, I want to say Allie, based on her answer above alone. <laughs> I want to go with Kelly. Oh. Oh, was that not even a thought? Oh, I just no, feel no. like it's well, like blunt enough. That if, we're, she, if we're gonna overthink this to its death, yeah, let's do it. We have not yet had a Kelly O'Hara answer. See, this is this is the Scantron thoughts. You know, mm-hmm. it's like when you when you bubbled in C too many times, and you're like, well, now the answer's wrong. Exactly, because I can't have five C's in a row. We need we need a B. We do need a B. And it's gonna go Kelly O'Hara. Okay, final answer. Yeah, lock it I in. To go. <laughs> See. Just More crying oh my God. with my friends every single day and like play a sport okay. for for a job like what so i would say we got probably about i don't know 80 percent right i'm making up a number but we did that's pretty good bad. that's like a b it's a it's in solid b territory <laughs> well that's it for our game of guess who and thank you to all of the players who inspired us and shaped the future of u.s soccer for generations to come Coming up, I reveal my DraftKings picks of the week and Logan shares her latest good follow. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Good Follow. Before we get into our weekly picks, our partners at DraftKings have an offer that's perfect for any game day. Right now, new customers who bet $5 will instantly get $250 in bonus bets. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and sign up using promo code GOODFOLLOW. That's $250 in bonus bets to spend on parlays, live betting, or picking straight up winners after betting just $5. And if sports betting is not yet available in your state, you can still join in on all the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy and have the shot to win cash prizes. Again, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code GOODFOLLOW for $250 in bonus bets instantly after betting just $5 only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Okay, now it's time for this week's DraftKings Sportsbook picks. And when I look at this weekend's NWSL fixtures, I'm excited for the matchup between Racing Louisville and Angel City. In their last five games against one another, Angel City are 2-2-1. and And lately, Angel City have seemed to find an attacking rhythm, despite losing to Seattle last week on what are arguably some questionable calls. But Angel City are making a strong push for a playoff spot, and Captain Sarah Gordon said after last week's match that they know they're a second half of the season team and, quote, yes, they can make the playoffs. My player to watch is forward Alyssa Thompson. The former number one overall pick has scored four goals in the last three matches, and I have a feeling she'll do it again in Louisville. Logan, when you look at this Angel City and Louisville matchup, what are you most excited to see? Both teams go at it, to be honest. The little run that Angel City is on at like peak timing is just so perfect and everyone's really coming together. But Racing Louisville is just one of those sneaky teams. Like they have some sneaky good wins there. And Mm -hmm. if they really come together, like they could pull off a win, if not like by multiple goals. So I'm really excited to see just how it all pans out. I think Angel City will come out on top, but who knows? And I feel like it is going to be a big game, like instrumental for playoff standings. Well, and I'm really excited because I think we're going to really start to see Bethany Balser find her rhythm with Louisville. I'm such a big Bethany fan since, I mean, since she's been in Seattle. And I think this will be like her third or fourth game now with Louisville. But she scores goals. And during her end of time with Seattle, not so much. She wasn't really being used in the same way that she was before. But I think she's going to, we're going to start to see some Bethany Balser headers, which I love. Um, But yeah, I think... We're going to start to see her score more, but I think this one, I have a feeling this is going to be kind of high scoring. Sydney LaRue is probably going to do Sydney LaRue things. Um, who knows? This could be like a five to four game. We could probably see eight or nine goals easily. I feel like Angel City, like 
they've had one player kind of jump on the train as they go on. So I can definitely see that happening. I think what's also been really cool is seeing all the celebrities and athletes, specifically male athletes, investing in NWSL. When you look around the league, Patrick and Brittany Mahomes are investors in Casey Current. James Harden has invested in Houston Dash. Jack Harlow recently invested in Racing Louisville. Matt Stafford with Angel City. The list goes on. And now, most recently, Magic Johnson has invested in Washington Spirit. So with prominent investors finding interest and investing in the league, could we see the NWSL have the same growth and popularity as the WNBA? Big head shake, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I'm, I don't really know why they haven't yet, but I feel like this year was so instrumental with Caitlin and Angel that it's almost like something has to happen or we have to get like an amazing transfer, like Sam Kerr comes back or something like that. Like maybe there's just, we're just waiting for that one player that maybe the normal, somebody who's not really into soccer would still tune in to watch because they want to see it happen. But it's definitely like on its way up there. I think, well, I have so many thoughts on this. I think one, when you compare the two, it's really exciting to see NWSL keeps expanding its league and adding teams. And I hope the W continues to do that as well. And also, I think it's just something inherent about basketball in the States versus soccer in the States, because you don't have to be necessarily a WNBA fan, but Everyone gets excited about March Madness and people may not have known who Caitlin and Angel were two, three years ago, but they got to watch them compete for a championship during um, their college years. And soccer just doesn't have that same type of popularity, hopefully yet in the States. When you look at NCAA College Cup, it just doesn't get the same type of love that March Madness gets. And so those players that are coming from college and bringing new fans to the league, um, it's just not the, it's just kind of apples and oranges when you look at the W and NWSL. Um, and now we don't even have a draft in the NWSL anymore. So I think it's just going to take a lot of people continuing to talk about it and invest in it and get excited about it the same way that they have about the W. But um, I agree with you. I think it absolutely has the potential to have the same topic popularity. And that's not because I'm biased and I follow and support and cover the league. <laughs> I wonder um, if we need like an Alona Mar to pop off and get people, you know what I mean? Like you, you, if you have a person that champions the sport and, and makes it accessible, it, th like it's already on its way. And I feel like with soccer popularity everywhere else in the world, it's like, it's like sometimes you just need like one person to be like, Hey guys, soccer is cool. <laughs> so I have a thought to wrap this that I don't love. I have this thought because I'm going to just come right out and say it. I'm not a Swifty. I'm not. I, I, say I don't thing. mind her. Listen, like, okay. I said I'd make this concise and I'm going to make this concise. Early Taylor Swift, like 2009, mm -hmm. lo listened to her, loved her. Taylor Swift posts like 2014. I, I'm not her target audience. That all, that's all this all comes down to. However, her friendship with Alex Morgan and her friendship with the Mahomes, who, as we just said, invest in Casey Current. It's going to, unfortunately, not unfortunately, I'm going to say fortunately, it's going to take someone like Taylor Swift popping up at an NWSL game for people to start getting really excited about it the way that they have an um, NFL. So it's going to take, to your point, someone of such magnitude to be like, I go to soccer games too. And they're really fun. I agree. And I am also not a, I'm also not a Swifty. And I <laughs> liked her in the beginning and I respect the crap out of her. I will let me underscore that. She knows she's a businesswoman through and through. She's talented. She's not, I, uh, I, it's, I was going to say something mean. I'm not going to, uh, she's great. Um, but I think she does what she does with her platform and how she uses her influence is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I think she, and maybe a couple others, like maybe a little bit more uh, mid tier and just the trickle down effect. I think we could see, I could see a nice, a nice increase in viewership and, and especially with all the other dudes investing too. I think that's great. I think that's a great stamp of approval and like, Hey guys, come on <laughs> over. Water's warm, you know? I was going to say, I clearly think I offended Logan, which she, she must be a Swifty. No, 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 no. Down to the way that you started the sentence, everything you just said was in my head coming up next. <laughs> like, the way, like, it was actually terrifying, which is why I had that reaction. It was like, I was planning on being like, I'm not a Swifty, <laughs> but I, yeah, no, um, not my music taste, but 
I 100% agree with you. Oh, you don't like the same lyrics over and over again? That's crazy. Everything sounds the same. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, we can go. We... For a future show, we could have a whole yeah, conversation <laughs> about the intersection of Taylor Swift and sports. We have perfectly teed this up for the next time we talk about it, but I do agree it'll take someone like her uh, to start showing up to NWSL games for people to pay attention. And for the growth of the league, I'll ask for it and accept it. But. Mm-hmm. Let's move on. Katie, the Paralympics wrapped up last weekend and it was announced that along with record breaking crowds on site in Paris, networks saw a 125% increase in viewership from the Tokyo Games. How amazing is it to see that kind of jump for a group of athletes who don't get enough attention? I'm so excited about it. I was so pumped. I made, I made sure I was watching it on every platform I had just to help the streaming numbers. I was like having it up on my laptop. I had it on my TV. I had it on my phone. I was like, we're doing it all. Um, it was so fun. And I loved everyone online getting excited about it i love seeing the the highlight moments i loved seeing uh athletes with one leg clear a high jump bar like it just was amazing and beautiful and i it tickled my my little ada ally heart well logan the solheim cup teed off yesterday and before i get to my question can you please explain to our good follow audience what the solheim cup is for anyone who might not know Yeah. So if anybody knows what the Ryder Cup is, it's the woman's version of that. So basically you have USA against Europe. It happens every two years, switching between USA and Europe. Three days, day one and two, it's like a team format playing four ball and foursomes. And then day three, it's like one person from each country against another in stroke play. And that kind of like determines who wins. It's been pretty back and forth over the years, but Europe is going for their fourth in a row. So it'll be interesting to see how it all unfolds. Okay. So tell me about this year's roster. How, how is it made up and who stands out to you? So the rosters are made out of Rolex rankings, the top U S and European players, after that and then captain's pick but this year usa has three players in the top 10 including lilia vu and nelly corda who are top one and two in the world and then they have rosang so they're kind of good over there and europe has celine boutier who's just on that 10th mark so when it comes to just looking at rankings on paper usa definitely has the better team um europe has charlie hall who always come clutch And both teams have veteran experience. So I think USA has the better team, but who knows? Because Europe has pulled it off the past few years. Okay. Well, so my last question for you is who do you think you're going to win? USA. I I really see it happening, especially with the way that all their top players are playing right now. I think they'd have to make a big mistake and Europe is going to have to be like on top of everything for every single round. Okay. Well, we'll see what happens and we'll see if Logan is right. And as you all know, the foundation of this show is that communities get built one good follow at a time. And each week, one of us will highlight a person, page or brand as the good follow of the week. So, Logan, you are up this week. Who is your good follow? My good follow of the week is two-time Paralympian Anastasia Pagonis, a.k.a. at Anastasia KP on Instagram. Let's watch this little video about her to learn more. Hi, I'm Anastasia Pagonis, and I'm here about to work out. Not only does beauty and makeup make me feel amazing and is a way of therapy for me, so is athletics and being in the gym. As a professional swimmer, I need to be in the gym to build muscle. I think the gym can be very intimidating, especially for someone who has a disability or a visual impairment, but that's why I have people in place to help me. So she has autoimmune retinopathy and lost her vision at 14 years old. In Tokyo, she made her debut when she was 17, set a world record in the 400 meter S11 preliminaries. And then in the final, she topped that by four seconds to win gold and obviously get another world record. So she won her first Paralympic gold medal at 17 years old, making her debut, which is so crazy. But on top of that, she has 2.5 million followers on TikTok. And she is so fun to watch, like answering all of the questions that I've ever had. Like it is so educational, Mm -hmm. but then there's also swimming content, the Paralympics content, and she 
is so good at makeup. Like it is just mesmerizing to watch. Plus she also has a guide dog Radar, Radar who is so incredibly cute. Yeah. And there's even more like educational content with him. I just love it. Like I binge watch all of her stuff. So that's my good follow of the week. Everyone go follow at Anastasia underscore K underscore P. And we want to hear from our fans. Who is your good follow? Send us your nominations to at good follow show and tell us why we should talk about them. <laughs> good follow is brought to you by DraftKings. We'll see you all next week. <laughs>